My name is Colin Scott. I am the Assistant Director for Transfer Emissions here at Western. Joining me today is Steve Pace from our office. Steve is probably a great go-to for any questions that you have regarding our communication strings as well. He's also the one that set up the meeting today. But joining us from our departments today is Laura Dora. She is the head of housing for us, works with transfer specific. And then of course we have Emily Hazel who's um, overseeing our dining aspect. So those two can ask, answer any questions in specific for those areas. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to of course our housing and dining team and I'll let them explain some of the benefits of Western, some of the things that we can do for your students. Thanks so much. Um, well, on behalf of Emily and I, we appreciate the chance to share a little bit about housing and dining because we usually do the recruitment events, but we get a chance to talk with students one-on-one -on -one during events, um, both our beginners and transfer students. So getting a chance to put some more information at the home locations where the transfer students are starting is valuable to us because it the more questions we answer, the better they feel confident coming into Western. Um, I will share for Emily and I, we appreciate questions as we go along. If we say something, please don't feel like you have to hold it until the very end. Just ask us as we go, um, that would be fine. For Emily and I, it's not so much about the specific meal plans or buildings or apartments you choose, You know, that's part of the process, but it's the environments that happen on campus, the people that you meet that live right next door or striking up a conversation in one of the dining centers uh, as you're sitting down for lunch or dinner at the end of the day. That social component, that engagement component is really important for us. Um, housing, for example, we each year we have over 1600 events that we do as we try to help facilitate those new social connections for students as we take them to events happening on campus, whether it's athletics or a student organization. Um, so that engagement is a huge value set of ours with housing and dining. Um, academic support is too. Nobody gets a note on their transcript that they were a great roommate or not. <coughs> but we do wanna help them with their degrees towards engineering or business, political science, whatever they're choosing to study or if they're still planning to explore. Um, we do that in housing of having study areas learning communities where they can live with others in similar classes. Um, dining is a great partner in this too. If you've got a test in the afternoon, they have brain food available. When your test is done, you can go back into dining and get your pepperoni pizza and wings and chili cheese fries that you just need to veg afterwards. Um, so we cover the whole spectrum for our students. Housing specifically, we have five different residence halls where our transfer students live. Um, the sixth one is for beginning students only. Um, three apartment complexes, and we have one oddity, so we're just gonna call it Spindler Hall. Um, and then throughout campus, we, will, we have two dining centers, um, one located in our Valley neighborhood where the residence halls are, and one located in the center of campus that will open up this fall that Emily will talk about. Now, with that, we have, I guess I will say that 45% of our students on campus are actually sophomore juniors and seniors. We are not a predominantly freshman only environment. So students who are coming in who are classic 18, 19 will find a fit. Students coming in who are 25, 26 years old will find a fit as well. Um, of the transfer students who live on campus, most of them still opt for the residence halls because they're wanting that classic college experience and know that they will meet more people when they are surrounded in the residence hall with you know, 50 people on a floor, four or 500 people in their building that's there. Um, of those who do live in the residence halls, we have learning communities. So half are on a traditional floor and half are in one of our residential learning communities. And about an even split between our general learning communities and one that we've designed specific for students who transfer. So I'll come back and talk about those in just a moment. The area, the residence hall area where our students live is called the Valley Neighborhood. A series of five, some of six, depends on where numbers are, buildings that are kind of your classic long hallway with rooms on each side. It's what we call suite style setup. So imagine room 101 connects to room 102 by a shared bathroom in between. So you have a suite of four men or a suite of four women in a true co-ed hallway. Um, there are also single rooms that are available in the valleys. It's just sometimes a little harder for our new students to um, find them because our current students pick rooms first and a lot of them shift into that single room their second or third year. 
the valleys is a great environment, only about 50% first year students. So again, a large number of transfer students and upper level students in the area. Um, and it's the only home of where our learning communities are. Because you can't come to campus, but sometimes students want to get a sense of like, what is a residence hall like? We've got a brief tour of one of the Valley Suites. So there's an entry area as the students come in. There's a large six foot closet there that they share with their roommate. And then in front of them is kind of the living area, so to speak, and to the side is that bathroom that connects to a room that's a mirror image on the opposite side. Um, all of our residence halls have what we call loftable furniture. So it's like an extra headboard and footboard in the room and a stabilizer bar. And then there's a track that goes all the way to the ceiling or down low to the floor that they can set their bed at any place within it. Helps expand floor space. The bathrooms, since it is inside the student room with the four people sharing, the students do need to clean it. It's kind of a long, narrow space. There's a shower stall on one side, double vanity and toilet stall on the other. So it kind of gives you a sense. Um, these are not our newest buildings, not our oldest either, so thankfully. Um, they were built in the 1970s, so they do have a little bit of that cinder block feel with them. But again, that's where we emphasize it's the environment that we create within them for our students. <clears throat> now, I mentioned learning communities. and Western, we have 10 now, 11 in the fall, and hopefully 12 in fall 23, um, where students are on anywhere from one to four floors with a pre-identified commonality. Um, could be in the same academic college, could be a similar life experience like being a transfer student. Um, we have found that the learning communities have been a great academic advantage for students. Those in the academic learning communities tend to have a 0.2 or higher GPA compared to their non-learning community peers. Um, and we have found students in learning communities tend to graduate in four years. For our students who transfer that remaining three, four, three, two, or one year, um, at nearly double the rate as our students living off campus. So they really do have a huge impact. Um, this is our current menu, so to speak, of learning communities. Um, almost every college has one with the exception of education. We are working to bring them back as they redesign some things. Um, and then we also have some interest-based communities. Empowering Futures will be new for fall. It is actually connected to a housing scholarship um, aimed predominantly at beginning students or what I would call a younger transfer student, someone who's in that um, 10, maybe 12 credits or less, so still relatively new in college. And that's because it's a two-year program um, that's there. The scholarship for fall 22 has already closed, um, but it will reopen in spring for those who are joining campus in fall 23 um, within it. Our global and languages community is a really awesome environment with a lot of our international students. So you could have an international roommate or suite mate. There's a huge, large community kitchen where you have a lot of shared meals being made. So if you wanna sample food from a different country or learn how to actually learn how to make sushi, you can do that. And then in return, we help our international students transition to Western, learn about you know classic American life. We go to a corn maze and um, pumpkin rides and that sort of thing in the fall with them. Spectrum House is a community where students who want to discuss and explore gender and gender identity can live together in a supportive environment. And then I mentioned we have our community unique to students who transfer to Western. Um, what we emphasize with all of our, ooh, something funny happened there, sorry. What we emphasize with all of our learning communities is creating a sense of belonging on campus. Um, having that known element with neighbors, academic support, um, regardless of whether it's an academic learning community or not. And our students who are in learning communities tend to return to live on campus at higher rates than those who don't. They really find kind of a special magic that's there. The transfer learning community specifically is three floors in one building. It's designed for a more experienced transfer student. So they have to have 21 credits. Um, or be 20 years old with at least 14 credits to be eligible to live in the community. Um, what our students, <laughs> our transfer students like, because we acknowledge that there's a huge financial shift going from community college or a different four-year college to Western, and then potentially living from home to living on campus. So what we actually do is all of the rooms in the transfer community are single rooms, but they are billed at a different rate. We actually build them the double person rate. So they save, um, little over a thousand dollars a semester, um, which is a great advantage for them. Um, new for fall 22, so this upcoming fall, 
there is also an empowering future scholarship associated with the transfer community. Um, it is up to 3,200 for next year, split between the two semesters. Um, any Michigan resident can apply. Priority given to students who are in the Detroit, um, Kalamazoo, and Grand Rapids areas. Within that, and the goal of the of it is connected to a donor gift who really is trying to have an impact on retention and graduation rates um, with sense of belonging and self-discovery and engagement, key components of that. For us with our transfer community, we really try to help them form that peer support group, new social network, meet people, whether it's in the building or throughout campus. We do a lot with engagement so they can get that sense of being a true Bronco here at Western. Um, and then we also connect them to the resources. They knew where to find things when they were with you. We're helping them learn where's our career services office. Um, how do I add drop a class if I need to change something? So what we have found looking at our last nine cohort years is our students who are in the transfer community are retained at a significantly higher rate than our transfer students who live off campus, which I think is awesome. That tells us cat acrobatics, sorry, <laughs> that we are doing some good stuff that's there. Um, when I've surveyed the students who live in the transfer community, top two reasons they want to live there, and top two things that they like about living there the most have always been the single room at the discounted rate and living with students who are first semester transfer students like themselves, that shared story piece. So we acknowledge they know college, they just happen to be in a new one. And so we do things a little bit more sophisticated than we might do for a classic first year student. Apartments themselves. Um, this is usually where our transfer students sometimes have a challenge when they are interested in the apartments because of credit audit processes. So that if they are coming in and already admitted, their fall credits have transferred, but they're still waiting for spring. And our apartments on Western's campus are for sophomores and above. So that's where that credit um, audit process can sometimes be challenging for them. We have three different apartment complexes, as I mentioned, and our funny little Spindler Hall, which is basically a residence hall that we run like an apartment, so less staff, different type of contract. Um, our Arcadia Flats and Western View complexes are actually a 10 and a half month contract. They start in early August, um, and so students finish up in late summer. Stadium Drive and Spindler Hall are a classic fall plus spring contract um, or a summer contract. Both of them um, have opportunities for students who are transferring and starting in January to have a space, but that would more likely be in Stadium Drive or Spindler just because of the nature of how that contract runs. Um, and to live in any of campus housing, you only need to be taking one credit hour at Western. I should clarify that. Um, our sign up process is probably the biggest thing to note. Um, Arcadia and Western View are the most popular apartment complexes and their sign up process actually begins early spring semester. There's a lottery sign up that goes live in December and continues through January. And then in early February, students will be given a day and time to go in to pick a unit and sign a contract. So Arcadia, Western View fills the fastest. <coughs> Excuse me. It is our most popular con complex. And then Arcadia Flats is our newest opening up last in January. Um, Stadium Drive and Spindler are on a different cycle because we know again, sometimes people are making college decisions. And so that sign up process will actually begin tomorrow, April 6th. Um, and our, since our apartments do go fast, if any of your students are considering them, encourage them to look at those sign up dates. Um, so they're prepared to log into the housing portal on that date to sign up. Now, because you do have to have 26 credit hours to be eligible, um, what we do with housing is if you are close, you still have access to sign up because we know that they may be taking spring courses that once that credit audit is done, we'll get them to 26. So as long as they have kind of 12 or 13 credits, they should have access to the housing portal to sign up for an apartment. If they are being told they are denied access, then it may be that they don't have enough for us to know that yes, for sure, they'll make it to 26 credits. They can always contact our office to ask questions about that as well. Um, almost all of our units have a furnished or unfurnished option. Um, the exception is Spindler Hall. So let me kind of walk you through each of these a little bit because um, the show and tell is more fun than a little chart. Um, Arcadia, as I mentioned, opened up in January 20. It has five different unit types from a two-story two loft, studio, 
two bedroom studio, two bedroom flat, and what we call a two bedroom double four person, um, which is our most economical option that's there. Um, right now, we actually still have space in our two bedroom studios. Um, this is a photo of one of those. So if anyone is coming in in the fall, um, we will leave sign up for them open until all the two bedroom studios are filled. Um, and they're kind of a unique thing. Um, imagine you walk into an entry area, on one side is the shower stall, on the other side is the bathroom and vanity, and then in front of you, you have your own kind of private area that's bedroom and kitchenette. Um, and that's what our two bedroom studios are like. The one person studio, similar concept, you just have bed, kitchenette, and bathroom all in one location. And the two, four, two bedroom, four person one, um, it's a shared kitchen, shared bathroom, and then within the room, it's you and a roommate. Um, so a little different kind of complex. On our housing website, diagrams of all the different unit types in KD are there as students can look at those as well as price points and furniture provided. Um, Western View, I mentioned, is our most popular. It's our classic one, two, three, or four bedroom units. Um, there's a community center, an outdoor sports area, and a really cool kind of patio with a fire pit that I see a lot of students enjoying during the summer months that's there. Um, what I love about both Arcadia and what, well, what I love about Western View is students have a bedroom and private bathroom. So for example, this is a three, the layout of a three bedroom unit. Um, you have a key that gets you into the apartment where you've got a shared kitchen and living room. And then your key also will get you into your individual bedroom and bathroom. So for most of them, the bedroom and bathroom are together. Um, like you see on the far left, for some reason with the three person, there is one person who gets a bed and a separate bathroom um, for how that lays out. The units do have washers and dryers provided. Um, all of our other complexes have a centralized laundry room. Um, and I should mention for fun that laundry is free on Western's campus. So they do not need to go home to be um, economical. They, it's already covered for them here on campus. Stadium Drive is one of our oldest apartment complexes, kind of still in that 1970s era that's there. It is a home, it's where you will find our families, um, graduate students as well as undergraduate students. It's a classic two bedroom with a shared living room, kitchen and bathroom. Um, and what we're excited about, because not all campuses have this option, is our apartments there are pet friendly. So we always work with students who have emotional support animals with housing or an assistance animal. But in Stadium Drive, if you want to bring your cat, if you want to bring your dog, um, if you want to bring, and I had someone ask me about a bearded dragon, um, as long as you fill out the application and they're approved, yes, you can have your pet with you at Stadium Drive. So um, a cool way that students can kind of tailor their experience. And then I mentioned our lovely oddity of Spindler Hall. Um, Spindler Hall was actually built in the 1940s. It's a beautiful architecturally designed building um, located on East Campus, so it's not in the heart of classes, but is close to our College of Health and Human Services if any of your students are transferring for that. Um, it is our cheapest option in the sense that rent would equate to just under $400 a month. Um, versus some of the other apartments, you're looking at $600, $700, $800 a month with it. And they are all single rooms because it's a classic residence hall with a community bath setup, and then large public areas where you've got game rooms, community kitchen, laundry, etc. So only 92 students in the building, um, actually a good number of graduate students and um, international students. Um, and some of them have been there a while. Um, we all had a little party when Amir from Pakistan finally finished his doctorate after seven years and went back home. So you kind of get a cool environment um, that happens in Spindler Hall. Um, it again is students who are 21 or senior credit status, 88 credits for us um, to live in Spindler. So a couple of things about amenities. Throughout all of housing, students have Wi-Fi in their rooms. Um, for those who are in Stadium Drive and the Valley Residence Halls, there's also a high-speed Ethernet connection, uh, which helps if they do a lot of streaming or downloading. Um, we talked about laundry. Most of the buildings have um, a kind of front desk service desk where they can ask questions, get information in the residence halls. That's where they could check out things like the ping pong paddles to go play in the middle of the afternoon, check out vacuums if friends were coming. And then the residence halls all have a 
office within them for the full-time professional staff who run the building. So 24 seven, they've got access to someone should they need it. Staff, um, our residence halls on each floor are resident assistants who are upper level students there to be a resource and support for residents. And then our apartment staff have um, anywhere from one to four within the complex. So a little bit of a different staffing pattern there. As we know, they are older students and need a little less from us than our new students to campus. Um, and then our learning communities have added staff members. So for example, in the transfer learning community, there's a learning community assistant who transferred to Western um, at least a year prior. So they've been through that. They know the ropes, what things um, were challenging for them and how to support students. Our engineering community has upper level engineering students in it, et cetera. Um, and they help plan a lot of the activities and events that students experience. Um, safety is the final thing I want to address because that's important to us. All of our buildings, apartments or residence halls are locked 24 seven. And then within the residence halls, there is a second set of security doors that lead to residential areas. Um, with staff in the building on call, with the front desks open in the evenings, um, we have found every year, and I have been at Western for 19 years, we've never fallen below 87% of our students saying they feel safe in their apartment or in their residence home. So I think that's a point of pride for us. We want to make sure we know Western's larger than hometown for some students, smaller than hometown for others, but for all of them, it is a new environment to live in. So let me kick it over to Emily to talk some about our dining options. Oh, I forgot one more slide, signing up. Um, our process is all online um, for students who are considering the residence halls. All incoming transfer students will receive a booklet in April that walks through a little bit more in depth how to sign up for housing and our next steps. Um, since 80% are in the residence halls, I just wanted to share that um, there's no deposit to sign up for housing. It's not contingent on um, that. You just have to be admitted to Western. And the sign up process goes live in late January. Um, if they do want to have a roommate, we have something that goes live in April called Roommate Finder, where they can search by interests, living habits, and social habits, as well as academic college. And in May, they self select their room, um, kind of like a Ticketmaster or StubHub. So if I was interested in the transfer community, I meet the eligibility, I will go pick Lefebvre Hall. I'll pick the fifth floor. I want to be in the middle around everybody and actually see a map of the floor and choose my room. So it's all kind of a self-select process in that regard. Now we get to turn it over to Emily to talk some about dining. Thanks, Laura. So um, I am the nutrition specialist within dining services. Um, and really before I jump into it, um, if your students are thinking about living in a residence hall, they are required to have a meal plan unless they live in Valley One, Britton Hadley. Um, but if they're choosing to live in on-campus apartments, then we have meal plan, kind of like apartment meal plans as an option for those students. So I'll get into the specifics of those after I kind of talk about what options we have on campus, but I just wanted that to be um, pretty clear. So um, this is a spread from the Valley Dining Center. Uh, there's a lot of different choices that you can choose from. Go, you're, you are fine, Laura. Um, but so generally speaking, uh, dining centers are open continuously from breakfast through dinner. Um, so during the fall and spring semesters, what that means is 7 a.m. breakfast begins uh, and the dining center will stay open through dinner, uh, which closes at 8 p.m. On the weekends, uh, similar, but breakfast just starts at 9 a.m. instead of 7 a.m. But our dining centers are dine-in locations uh, and all you care to eat. So essentially students are swiping their Bronco card, which is where their meal plan is housed. And then they can choose from the variety of venues that are available inside. There's a lot of customizable choices. And like Laura mentioned, when she showed the map, um, the two dining centers will be close to uh, residence halls and close to classes. So you're never too, your students are never too far from food. So I want to give some specifics about the Valley Dining Center itself. This building opened in 2016. Uh, it can seat about a thousand students at a time, um, but it's very, very busy at that point. And we're not usually reaching that capacity, um, but it is a very large facility. 
Um, so generally speaking, uh, featured here is traditions, which is where we have our rotating menu that served. Traditions serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. Um, and the menu is posted online uh, so students can see in advance what is being served. The online menu includes nutritional information as well as allergen information. But if you if your students do have any food allergies, I always appreciate being able to talk to those students um, just to make sure I understand what their concerns are and can help guide them in um, the direction that they need to know to stay safe and uh, find a variety of food to eat on campus. But beyond traditions, um, kind of the next thing that just shifted over to the left is pastoria. Uh, so that's our pizza area. So we have Hearthstone pizzas that are served. We have a pasta bowl area. Um, so there's right now there's a pasta bar. So you choose noodles, get Alfredo sauce or marinara sauce. We're hoping in the fall we'll be able to bring back our um, build your own pasta bowl option, which unfortunately this year was cut due to COVID issues of supply chain and staffing. Um, but that's something that is often a student favorite is being able to build their own pasta bowl. Um, we have a grill, it's called Blazing Bronco. So there we're serving kind of classic grilled chicken, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, grilled cheese, French fries. Um, we have vegan burgers. Uh, and then occasionally we have uh, chicken wings, jalapeno poppers, or mozzarella sticks that are offered on a rotating basis for kind of like a kind of grill appetizers for a little bit of that comfort food that Laura was talking about. Um, we also have a full salad bar and a full deli line at the Valley Dining Center uh, and a dessert area that's called Sweet Sensations. So there's soft serve ice cream, there's always a few different types of cookies and then desserts um, like featured daily. So whether that's um, cheesecake or a s'mores bar, there's a lot of different um, varieties that are served. I really want to highlight two of the kind of like student favorite venues within the Valley Dining Center as well. Cilantro's is pretty much like a Qdoba or Chipotle where you build your own burrito, taco, nachos. Um, so that's uh, definitely a favorite. Right now, that is offered at lunch and dinner, Monday through Friday. Again, um, the weekend, um, it was removed from weekend service due to uh, staffing challenges this year, but we're hopeful um, in future years, we'll be able to bring that back on the weekend, um, rotating with Pacific Plate as well, which is the other kind of student favorite. Uh, so Pacific Plate is a build your own stir fry or ramen bowl. And essentially, uh, students select select their the fresh vegetables that they want. They select their protein option. Um, the those items are stir fried in a wok right in front of them. Uh, it's put on top of white rice or ramen noodles, and then garnished with a sauce or a broth. So there's a lot of customization um, that students are able to do here as well. This is also an area that we serve halal chicken on a daily basis. Um, in addition to uh, tofu and then we have rotating like a rotating protein item so beef pork or shrimp um, or vegan nuggets that are served as well so that's like a weekly rotation but uh, at this area we're we're able to accommodate a lot of um, kind of dietary needs or accommodations just because of the individualized nature of pacific plate that each bowl is being prepared specifically for each student Additionally, we have an area called My Pantry at the Valley Dining Center, which is specifically for students who have celiac disease or other food allergies. Um, this space is an access controlled space, so students who register with Disability Services for Students meet with me and we identify this as a space that would be useful to that student. They're then given uh, Bronco card access to this room right here, which has, as you can see, a cooler um, that's stocked full of gluten-free bread products such as bagels, muffins, bread, um, tortilla, wraps, cookies, um, gluten-free pasta, sometimes just like plain white rice. So gluten-free and nut-free alternatives to some of the kind of standard options that are offered from the other venues within the Valley Dining Center. Um, students who have celiac disease or a wheat allergy can find um, options that work for them from this space. There's also gluten-free waffle batter that's kept in that fridge. Uh, and then students have access to make their own waffles, use the dedicated gluten-free toaster, 
um, and microwave that's in this space. This space is connected to a really small kitchen where our staff is able to individually prepare meals for students. Um, there is kind of a pre-planning um, component to it that students do have to order online in advance by 10 a.m. of the day that they want food. So it's not exactly um, just show up whenever you want food and you're good to go like the rest of the Valley Dining Center is, but it does allow us to um, individually prepare meals for students, which works for a lot of people who have very specific dietary needs. The online ordering kind of individual preparation is av only available Monday through Friday for students. But um, so I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about the new dining center that will open up in the fall. So that will be located on the third floor of the new student center. Um, and so this is directly in the heart of campus, um, immediately uh, next to the library, uh, really close to um, a lot of classes. So it'll be very convenient, um, especially during the breakfast and lunch period when classes are happening close nearby. But there'll be a dining center, a few quick casual restaurants on the first floor, as well as a variety of other retail locations like a print shop, a Starbucks. Um, ooh, I can't remember what else will be in there, but there's a lot of activities um, for students to partake in within the new student center itself. But I'm just focusing on the dining center. Um, so again, that is, it will be on the third floor. Uh, and similar to the Valley Dining Center, um, there's a lot of customizable choices uh, from the various venues that are located inside. It is a smaller space than the Valley Dining Center, um, ranging from about 500 seats to 700 seats, depending on what spaces are being used for dining area versus study area uh, on the third floor. But um, it's we're very excited. Uh, here is featured classics, which is in many ways uh, a different sort of traditions, which I focused on at the Valley Dining Center, that classics will be serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, with the, that rotating menu that's going to be posted online. So I wanted to just uh, show you a few more renderings of other spaces within the dining center as well. So Slice will be our um, pizza area. So again, Hearthstone oven, there'll be cheese and pepperoni pizza, uh, as well as probably some sort of cheesy breadstick option and marinara sauce that's offered. Uh, I think the next rendering that I have is um, called Delight, which is the dessert area. Uh, so this is actually, this will also house uh, the Golden Brown Bakery, which is WMU's um, bakery on campus. And so there's a beautiful butcher block table, state-of-the-art ovens in there. So Delight will also serve as a little bit of a showpiece element that um, if students are, you know, just kind of people watching, they could also watch our baker, um, you know, decorating cakes or putting together desserts. Um, so Delight kind of has like a small plate, um, delectable treat sort of feel. Of course, we'll have soft serve ice cream um, as well. And you can also see uh, the deli kind of in the back of this rendering. Um, so uh, the, the new dining center should have a full deli similar to the Valley Dining Center, a full salad bar. Uh, Delight as the dessert area classics, which is that rotating um, menu option. So a variety of different foods served um, on a four week menu cycle. We'll have a grill area, hopefully. Um, so again, that'll be hamburgers, cheeseburgers, grilled cheese, French fries, um, that sort of fare. Uh, and then an area called Global Fusion, um, which we're really hopeful to be able to um, open up to full capacity and share with students. Um, but again, the COVID challenges that we've been um, experiencing have um, kind of uh, uh, been a, a barrier for planning, but there's a lot of options, a lot of customization that students can choose from um, using their meal plans at the two different dining centers that we have.
I also want to mention Dash, which is our grab and go location. So this will be located immediately next to the entrance to the new student center dining center, um, which will allow students to take food to go um, if they don't have the time to sit and eat. Because like I mentioned, the dining centers that we have are dine in locations because they're all you care to eat locations. Um, so from Dash, we'll have uh, a handful of sandwiches, salads, cheese and pepperoni pizza, um, pasta and sauce, some vegan entrees, fruit, desserts, beverages, all available to take to go. Uh, and this will be available for students Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, something that we are really excited about offering, uh, it's not new, but we're really trying to uh, make sure students are aware about it, is our reusable container program. Uh, WMU has a really big um, kind of sustainability lean, uh, as I'm sure that you're aware. And so this is one way that we're really trying to um, reduce our, our waste and keep the amount of trash that's going into the landfill from um, our carry out options just because uh, there's there's a lot of waste that happens um, when food is you know packaged to go so um, reusable green containers is something that we're um, excited to be offering from dash um, in the fall as well so um, specifically about the meal plans that we have available. So for students who are choosing to live in either on-campus apartments, off-campus apartments, or just you know specifically off-campus, we do have these block meal plans that are available to them. This is purchased, um, I think the earliest you can purchase it is like close to a month before each semester begins. Um, but they're available throughout the semester. So halfway through the semester, if somebody uh, decides that, oh, they, they are interested actually in having a little bit more convenient of a food option, um, a student can go in and purchase a meal plan and then the next day be able to use it. So um, four different kind of amounts that are available, uh, 100, 75, 50, or 25 meals uh, that can be used throughout the semester. It is really important to note that these meal plans are only available for the semester that they're purchased. At the end of the semester, after finals week, if the student has any remaining meals as part of that block amount, they will be lost. They don't roll over from the fall and spring semesters. But in addition to those meal swipes, so that's what you would use to get into the Valley Dining Center or the new student center dining. Um, there's also dining dollars that are included with the 175 and 50. And that um, is kind of like a prepaid debit card that I'll talk a little bit more about. That just gives students some flexibility um, in terms of purchasing items at other dining run locations or the um, retail on the first floor of the new student center. For students who are living in the residence halls, again, um, most students are required to have a meal plan unless they're living in Britton Hadley. Um, so students living in the transfer living community would need to purchase one of these three meal plans. Um, so Bronco Gold Plus and Bronco Gold, these are our unlimited meal plans. So essentially students can choose to enter the Valley Dining Center um, or new student center dining as many times as they like each day, each week, each month, each semester, there is no limit. Um, so this works really well for somebody who is more of a snacky type person. Um, uh, so you don't really have to worry about making each meal swipe count. You can go in, get a cup of coffee, drink your coffee, and then head to class. Um, you don't need to, to be sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck because you have unlimited meal swipes. The only difference between the Bronco Gold Plus and the Bronco Gold is the amount of dining dollars and guest passes that are given um, for that semester. So um, guest passes do expire at the end of the semester, but the dining dollars roll over into the spring semester and then summer one. But every year, any dining dollars that are added will expire after June 30th. Um, so that's just kind of another thing that we like to make sure that students understand that the dining dollars, they have a little bit of flexibility throughout the academic year, but the guest passes do go away. Now, if a student has the Bronco Gold 
in the fall and then um, continues with the Bronco Gold in the spring, they would get a new allotment of dining dollars um, that's added on to any remaining dining dollars and get new guest passes um, as well. So dining dollars, um, a lot of our students will use them at the campus cafes uh, just to purchase things kind of dollar for dollar, just instead of paying cash or credit card, uh, a student can swipe their ID and use dining dollars instead. Um, in addition, if a student wants, like has run out of their guest passes and they want to bring in a friend or a friend or whomever they choose into the dining center with them, they can pay for that entrance using their dining dollars as opposed to cash or credit card as well. Um, the dining, dining dollars will also be accepted at the retail locations on the first floor of the new student center. So that's um, just, you know, another kind of added benefit and flexibility piece for the dining dollar um, use itself outside of the dining centers or dash grab and go. So lastly, campus cafes. We do have, um, there'll be eight different campus cafes in the fall. One of them is located in the library. One of them is at the College of Health and Human Services. So, um, you know, that's like, you know, maybe 10 minutes or, or like five minutes away from main campus. One of them is located on the engineering campus. So um, students who are either at the engineering campus or at the um, the aviation campus uh, in Battle Creek, they are able to use their meal plan to get a meal exchange option from those two different um, cafes. But otherwise, campus cafes are just primarily accepting dining dollars, cash, or credit. But the campus cafes, uh, we serve Water Street Coffee. We are a Pepsi campus, so there's a wide variety of different Pepsi products, Pepsi products that are available. Um, in addition to sandwiches, salads, soups, we do have a few local restaurants that deliver food. So Big Apple Bagels delivers bagels and Hunan Gardens delivers su sushi on um, Monday through Friday. So um, there's, you know, a lot of kind of quick, easy options that students can get from the campus cafes if they just don't have time um, to stop into a dining center before heading off to class or um, just kind of want you know, something different, that campus cafes are um, located kind of, uh, you know, more like, um, more remote around um, campus. So um, that's pretty much all that I have for dining. If there's any questions for either Laura or I, we'd be really happy to answer for you all. So um, at this time, we'll conclude. I do appreciate everyone's contributions today. Thank you so much for that. This was very informative. So uh, if you do have further questions, please feel free to reach out to any of our contact points. Um, anybody here on the video today, of course, we're, we're an open book. Um, you can find all of our contact information online. Um, but if you need anything, definitely reach out to the office and we'll connect you. Aside from that, I do appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much.